Okay. Um, how we can use those to um, to figure out where an image is going to form and determine those three criteria for the image. Is it real or virtual? Is it up, upright or inverted? And is it enlarged and reduced or reduced? Okay. So that's where we're going to go from there. So I did, I showed a ray trace for a multiple lens system last time. This um, ray trace is essentially for a compound microscope. The way most microscopes or telescopes work that you're using with an eyepiece is the eyepiece will always act as a magnifier, all right? The eyepiece where you put your eye, it is a converging lens, but remember, if you have the object inside the converging lens, then that forms a virtual enlarged upright image. It acts as a magnifier. So what that means is those three criteria, even though you know we can't record that image, we can see it. So the eyepiece of a telescope acts as a um, acts as a magnifier. And I will tell you this right now, these labels are backwards. This is the eyepiece and this is the objective. Okay, the eyepiece is the one closest to your eye. The objective is the first lens or mirror that the light encounters that forms the initial image. Now, research telescopes a lot of times don't have eyepieces, or they never do. But what they do have is something at this initial focus point that allows the image to be captured like a ccd or a camera or some kind of collection mechanism i don't care about seeing the image they just want to record it on a computer but the idea is this object that we're looking at right here the first lens the objective remember this label is wrong the objective forms an image that's a real inverted image and Ideally, you would like for it to be magnified. For a microscope, that's possible. Remember, on those ray traces, if we put the image between, or if we put the object between the focal point and the radius of curvature, that gave us an enlarged image. With a telescope, that's not possible because we're looking at stuff that's way too far away. But for a microscope, the reason why the stage separation from that initial lens is what it is, is so that that object is in between the radius of curvature and the focal point. That gives you a little bit of magnification. Then the eyepiece will take that image and further enlarge it and give you a um, give you the magnified image. Okay. All right. And we talked about how you do the lens equation for each one and then the total magnification is the product of the individual ones. Well a camera uses two lenses, but there you don't want to form that final magnified image because that's a virtual image. And remember, you can't record a virtual image on film. You can't share it on screen. You can only look at it in, in, the, in, the, object, in the lens or the mirror. So there you want two real images formed. So one of the things that you can do is the final lens's job is to form that image on the film or on the CCD. And then you can change the spacing to create a zooming environment if that's what you, if you have the zoom lens or whatever. And then the other thing that a camera does is it controls the exposure by changing the size of the opening and gathering more or less light. And it changes the shutter speed to gather more or less light, okay? So if you've ever used a 35 millimeter camera with the fancy lenses, you know all this kind of from practice. Our eyeball does the same thing, but we don't get to control that. Our pupil is the aperture, and then our brain snaps an image every one, about, about 1 60th of a second is our shutter speed on our brain. Okay, so, um, we have multiple refractive material in our eyes. We have a lens, you know, which you, if you've ever known anybody that's had to have cataract surgery, they've had their lens dealt with. Um, we have 
the, the retina with all the nerve endings is essentially like a CCD. Okay, and then we have the optic nerve, which transfers that to our visual cortex or whatever it's called, that biology word, to make the picture. Okay, now also the cornea refracts a little bit and then the, the material, the humor, the vitreous humor in the eye, that is also slightly refractive. And our lens is actually not one index of refraction all the way through. It has a central portion that has a slightly different index of refraction than the outer portion, okay? The other thing about our lens is our lens can change shape. Our lens can change shape depending on if we're looking up close or far away. Okay, so when you talk about the human eye, you talk about things like far point. Far point is how far away you can see, see stuff clearly. And for, the, for normal vision, that would be infinitely far away. You may not be able to resolve detail, but you can see clearly there's no blurriness. Obviously, for a nearsighted person, that's, the far point is not infinity. The near point is how close you can hold something to your eye and still be able to focus clearly. Okay, because if you get too close, you can't focus. Your eye, it, you just can't, it can't change the lens shape enough. It's about 25 centimeters for the average eye, but as you age, that near point recedes and you have to start wearing reading glasses like I've had to do, or you wear bifocals or progressives. <clears throat> and when the reason is, is the lens has to change that shape for near to far vision, and as it ages, it can't change shape as much. It loses flexibility. So it can't, the rest position is when you're looking far away. That's why when you look at a computer a lot and you're doing a lot of work on the computer and then you look up, things will be blurry for just a minute. You have to kind of blink your eyes and let everything come back into focus. That's because your, your eye has flexed that lens and squanched it down to make it short and thick. And now it's having to relax and you kind of put those muscles into spasm if you've been looking up close for a really long time. But what happens with, with as you age, that lens can't squash down as much and become as thick. So our, far, our near point moves out. That's why, you know, you see older people holding their phones out or they make the bigger type or whatever. Okay. So y'all have probably all had a biology class that's talked about the structure of the eye more than I'm going to go over here, but this is the essential structure. But what I wanted to show in this picture was these ligaments. These suspensory ligaments are what flex that lens. And so when you get the headache from like what we call eye strain, when you get that headache from reading up close a lot, or if your eyes don't quite match your prescription, your glasses, a lot of that is because that lens has been tensed when you've been looking up close uh, too long and it, it does physically cause a pain. Now, in the back of the eye where the CCD or the film would be in the uh, retina, you've got your, uh, the macula and the fovea, the rods and cones are like the receptors on a CCD. The cones, are specialized for color vision. They are the structures that detect red, green, and blue in certain combination to create all the colors that we see. Remember, we're trichromats. We can see three colors, or three primary colors, and then we combine those to see about 10 million variations in color. Uh, y'all don't come in here at all till it's time for me to do class, and then here y'all all come. So, um, but anyway, so if you have someone who is colorblind, that means those cones are either damaged or they're not present. But color vision requires bright light or more light. So the cones are basically straight back from the pupil to get the maximum amount of light on them. Whereas the rods, which is what are C, what, C grayscale, uh, are, are good in dim light. That's why if you're out at night, you can't make out color very clearly because your rods are what's in control there. And they don't need as much light, but they also don't distinguish color. That's also why if you're looking at something in very low light conditions, if you don't look straight at it, you look off to the side of it a little bit, 
you're having more light strike your rods then, and you can see it more clearly than if you look at it straight on, which is where the cones are. And those don't work very well for that. Okay. So for near and far vision, the lens, for a near target here, the lens is tensed. These ligaments push down on it. They cause it to become thicker. So that means it will focus things up close, but far stuff will be blurry. Just like if you're trying to take a portrait, the camera's gonna focus on something up close and the background will be blurred out. That's essentially what your eye is doing. And then in the relaxed position, the lens is thinner because the ligaments are relaxed and now the near stuff is blurry and the far stuff is easier to see or is clear. But what happens with accommodation or presbyopia lack of accommodation is when this lens can't tense enough. And that's called accommodation. That's what that process is called. Now there are other eye issues that we have like nearsightedness. A lot of people are nearsighted. I'm nearsighted. What that means is there's something about the way our eye forms the image. Usually it's because the corneal curvature is too steep and the eye focuses the light too fast. So what happens is the light focuses in the uh, vitreous humor and not back on the retina. And by the time it gets back here to the retina, these light rays have spread out and things are blurry. Okay. So what you need for a nearsighted person is you need to spread those light rays out some, essentially, as they come into the eye. So what your glasses or your contacts do is they're a diverging or a negative lens they form a virtual image at your far point because your far point's not infinity anymore. And they form that virtual image of whatever you're trying to look at. And then that's what your brain gets. So your diverging lenses act as the objective. They form the initial image that then your eye takes in and allows you to see it. Okay. So if you're a nearsighted, your prescription is a negative number. Now the opposite of that is when you have curvature that doesn't focus the light fast enough and it tries to focus behind the, mat, behind the retina. You need something to pull it forward. So you need to focus it faster. So there what they do is they literally put a, lot, a converging lens in front of the eye and it pulls that focal point forward. So it forms a real image. In that case, it helps your eye form the real image. So it's two different processes for nearsightedness and farsightedness but it's because the light does not focus on the retina and you need to move it. There's a lot left. I think for every hundred nearsighted people, there's one farsighted person. Farsightedness is not as common. Now with astigmatism, which you can have in addition to either one of these things, it's because your cornea is not smooth. And so what happens is fluctuations in the structure of the smoothness of the cornea cause the light rays to scatter a little bit. So you'll get light rays that don't focus where they're supposed to. And it causes things to look distorted. Especially they show you those strong contrast images. It'll look like they're kind of moving or rolling. And that's from astigmatism. Okay, so when you look at a lens, what you buy is a prescription that is your focal length in what's called diopters. It'll be the capital D. So it's basically the focal length of your lens converted to meters, and then it's one over that. So that's your power. So um, like if you've got a minus 3.25, okay, a 3.25, I can actually find the focal length of my lens if I wanted to just by saying, okay, my power is minus 3.25, so that's equal to one over my focal length in meters. Okay. All right, I'm going to stop the recording part right there. And 